Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. Now, if you're new, go ahead and say hello and introduce yourself in the comments. We have a great community here, very supportive, very positive, and very helpful. And if you are new, let me introduce myself. My name is James, and I am a kidney patient. I was diagnosed just over two years ago, almost two and a half now, at stage five. Mm -hmm, GFR of eight, that was not very good. But I've used diet, lifestyle changes, and some luck to improve my overall health. My weight went down, my blood pressure got under control, I started exercising and doing things, and my kidney health also improved a little bit along with my overall health. Now it improved enough that I got rid of all my symptoms and my last labs showed me in the GFR of the low 30s, which makes me very, very happy because I've been able to so far avoid the need for dialysis. Now, if the time comes that I do need dialysis, I'm gonna need to get something hooked up to my veins and we're gonna talk about that tonight both with your guys' favorite nephrologist, Dr. Butt, and a special guest that we have here tonight with us. So let's go ahead and let's welcome Dr. Butt. Hey, Dr. Butt, how you doing? How's it going, guys? How's it going, y'all? Woohoo! Now, remember, there's some new people watching. Tell them a little bit about oh, yourself. Oh, I got to introduce myself. I got to introduce yeah, yeah, myself. Yeah. Okay, I'm Dr. Kasim Butt. I am a nephrologist from San Antonio, Texas. Um, I come on uh, James's show here quite often, but I'm also active on social media. I create video content, educational content, two minutes to five minutes of content about kidney health uh, in little bites. I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. My YouTube channel, if you're all watching, it's Your Kidneys, Your Health. So mm -hmm. please go over there and subscribe and like. So. Yeah, and your YouTube channel has been growing. I saw you broke 1,000 followers. Yeah, and th and that's to you guys in uh, the Data Vice world, Data Vice TV world. Y'all, I really appreciate y'all supporting me and uh, watching my videos and everything and, and actually subscribing. That's a big deal for even people watching right now. If they're not subscribed to Data Vice, get subscribed right now. Exactly. You know what? About 75% of the people who watch these videos are not subscribed. I would love they're it. They're freeloading. They they're freeloading, sir. <laughs> well, hey, they're they're learning more and they're they're finding hope, inspiration, and motivation to kick kidney disease to the curb. Yep. And now, you know what's funny, James? Uh -huh. I sometimes watch videos and I don't like them and I don't subscribe and I'm so hypocritical. <laughs> you know, like so. <laughs> you know, I actually have but, a but it lot helps. Of people that I follow or that I watch all their videos. And I'm not subscribed. Just yeah, keep yeah. my, my, my screen kind of cleaned up. But I encourage yeah, everyone, yeah. subscribe to Dr. Butt's channel. His videos are entertaining. They're to the point, which is one of the things I'm still learning how to do. <laughs> um, and they're very, very helpful, which is great. <laughs> now, I want to bring in our guest real quick and introduce him so that we can jump right on into today's topic. Because we are going to be talking about all sorts of stuff that I need to learn about for when the time comes, hopefully it doesn't, but if the time comes that I need to start preparing and going on dialysis. We have with us Dr. Singh, the creator of the Fist Assist, and we're gonna talk about what that is here. He is a vascular surgeon. Everybody welcome Dr. Singh. Hey, Dr. Singh. James, how are ya? Hey, doing great. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, so this is really exciting for me to be on this show with you all tonight. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Budd and James for the opportunity. I'm a vascular surgeon, which means I basically work on arteries and veins in the body. I've been doing that for close to 30 years now. I'm here in Silicon Valley, California. And while I still have a busy vascular surgery practice, I'm really excited about some new science that we're going to show tonight and a new device that uh, I think will change a lot of what we know about renal disease in terms of caring for patients. And especially as a vascular surgeon, arteries and veins are really important for dialysis. And I think we have a device that uh, slowly is gonna make its way to helping millions of patients in the world. Yep, 
Awesome. All right, we got Dr. Bud here. Look at this. This is the first video I've had with two guests at the same time. And I wasn't 100% <laughs> sure how it would fit on the screen, but it's great. We're all here. I feel kind of confined, to be honest with you. I do feel kind of confined. <laughs> and luckily, you're not. You're, you're lucky you're a thin person. You don't need all that extra room beside yeah. you. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's, so let's start kind of at the beginning, Dr. Butt. Um, and you brought some show and tell today. Oh, I, I brought the show and tell. And one of your followers actually messaged me on Instagram to remind me to bring that the show and tell today. So, awesome. Yeah. So, so I'm going to let you kind of kick this off because this is an area that I know very little about. Um, and I'm not sure exactly where to start. I know the veins need to be healthy and I want mine to be healthy for both blood draws as well as if I need to get a fistula installed. Um, and I don't even know if that's the right term. See, I don't even, yeah. <laughs> this is totally new to me. I'm used to cars. You go and you get it installed. I need some aftermarket accessories. <laughs> <laughs> well, I brought the aftermarket accessories right here. So, um, but uh, I guess we could start off real quick. So those of you guys out there that have kidney disease, right? We talk, we always talk about GFR, right? And mm -hmm. um, GFR stage three is the is the big one where a lot of people are in that kind of space, right? It's 30 to 60, that's where you are, right? It's divided into 3A and 3B, but uh, that's the big one, right? Three, uh, three. Now, when you drop out of three, meaning your GFR gets below 30, right? And that's when uh, we talked about in the show is that, you know, you get need to get worked up for dialysis access. Okay, dialysis access. And um, I'll let uh, Dr. Singh talk about those accesses in a second. But w what we want to do is get your veins in your arm matured, right? So we want to make sure to refer you for and what, what we call does a vein matured mapping. mean for those? Because for well, me, we're get I to know that. what it means, but it's only because I've read yeah. a lot of technical documents. I'm going to get to that. So when you're diagnosed with CKD uh, stage four and your GFR drops below 30, um, and you're in the twenties, that's when your uh, nephrologist is going to be like, you need to get a vein mapping. Okay. So you're going to get this vein mapping where they're going to do an ultrasound of your arm. And what's critical guys, what you guys are going to know, typically it's what you call your non-dominant arm. So th if they're going to put an access in your arm for dialysis, it's going to be your non-dominant. So if you're right-handed, they're going to go for your left and they're going to ultrasound your vein. Okay. And I'm going to let Dr. Singh talk about, um, uh, that the types of accesses in the arm, but the reason why we want to get those accesses in early guys is because of the show and tell stuff I just brought. Okay. We want to avoid these. Okay. Now these are catheters. Okay. So if you don't have an access created in your arm and it's not created and matured, guess what? You may be rushed to the hospital and have to get one of these placed in your neck. Um, oh, that's the thing they wanted catheters. to install in my neck when I was in the ICU. Yeah. So Oh, there, I have two, huge. I have two types here, guys. Yeah. I got two types. One, this is a non-tunnel dialysis catheter. So in order to do dialysis, guys, you have to take the blood out of a human being, put it in a machine, clean it for you, then return it back to you. If you don't have the access in an arm that matured and ready to go, they got to put this sucker in you. Okay. Now it's typically goes in your right, a right jugular vein right here. Mm -hmm. And it actually go, this part goes in your heart or right above your heart. And this part is going in your internal jugular vein. It'll be sticking out like this, okay? Now this one is a Quinton catheter, a non-tunnel dialysis catheter, meaning it's just temporary. It's supposed to be mm -hmm. left in for seven to seven to 14 days, okay? Um, sometimes it has this extra port on here, but it has three, uh, three ports. Uh, the red one is to take the blood out. The blue one is to take the, put the blood back in. Okay. This extra port is for nursing staff to actually draw, draw blood on you if they need to. But this is a more temporary one. Before you leave the hospital though, they're going to put in this more permanent one. It's called a permacath or a tunnel dialysis catheter. You see this right here? You guys yep. see it? Okay. It looks slightly Same thing. smaller, it's got... but thicker. No, no, it's, 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 it's bigger and thicker. Yeah, it's bigger okay. and thicker. Now, the thing is, this has two ports on there. Again, one to take the blood out of you, one to put the blood back in on dialysis. But on long here, I, right here, if you guys can see, see that little part right there? That's a little fibrous kind of area. That's a cuff. So what this cuff does is it actually secures it to your body. That way your body actually attaches to it and grows onto it, okay? Now, it actually goes in your neck vein, same as the other one I showed, right? goes in that neck vein, but it actually does not come out in your neck up here like that. It comes out in your, in your chest right out here and it sits right here. Okay. And that cuff is the thing that secures it to your body. Okay. So this part right here is the part that actually comes out of your body and is secure there and, and, and it's there. Now, 
again, we don't want we, the policy in nephrology really is uh, it used to be fistula first, but it also is now catheter last. We are trying to avoid catheters in you because people who get catheters do not do as well and do not live as long. Okay, so we want to avoid these as much as possible. They can lead to infection, have all sorts of issues. So um, the other options are to do a vein mapping of your arm, and I'm going to let Dr. Singh take over from here. Let's let him know what what, what do you think? Uh, what, what, after you get the vein mapping, where do you go from there? Yeah, so thanks everybody and really excited to be here. And and Dr. Butt, that was a great d demonstration of catheters. And you are absolutely right. Catheters are not our friends. There's complications placing these catheters. They're usually done as an outpatient procedure, but still there's complications. And the biggest ones is they can get infected. And one of the bigger costs in American healthcare is when these catheters get infected and you got to come back to the hospital and have it taken out. So when we think about dialysis, and Dr. Butt mentioned stage one, two, three, four, and five, and stage five, and James, you had stage five, and you experienced that. Stage five is a very dangerous stage mm -hmm. because that means dialysis is probably coming very soon. In my practice, I like to see patients when they're in stage three or stage four. That means probably with good medical management, maybe in four to six months, they may need dialysis or maybe not need dialysis. And they come to me as a vascular surgeon to talk about dialysis. And what we're talking about here today is hemodialysis, which basically means you're using your blood and a, and a way to get blood out of your body, whether through a catheter or whether to do something on your arm vein, a fistula, which will basically be a connection between your artery and your vein. It can be done here, which is a wrist fistula, if you have a good cephalic vein. It could be done here, if I can show that. It can be done here, which is the new endovascular fistulas. Or it can be done in the upper arm here, where you could have either a brachiocephalic or a basilic vein. And there's some big veins in your upper arm, bigger than the veins here. And of course, these are the smallest veins. But when we think about fistulas, we want to always start distally work our way here and work our way up here. And if we can have someone's fistula or dialysis work for five or six years on one arm, that's fabulous. So when we talk now, about we, a fistula- Why do we start at the wrist and move up? Is that to save some of the vein? Exactly, and that is such a great question. So if I do a fistula here and I use my vein here, I'm able to make the vein up here carry more flow. That's gonna help this vein get bigger. When these veins get bigger, you can make a, possibly a fistula here. And if this works for a while and that vein still doesn't work or fistula doesn't work, now you've helped develop these veins. And that was the science that I was dealing with for many, many years. I started doing my first fistulas as a college student at the University of Chicago. And I learned on animals that these arteries and veins, when you connect them, once you connect those arteries and veins, that vein's gonna get big. A bigger vein on your arm means easier for needles to be placed. So you want, and I'm going to talk about this term maturation. If someone has, and I see a question here, if someone has small veins. If someone has small veins, it really makes sometimes a fistula a difficult thing surgically to do. We as surgeons, we want a big artery and a big vein. When we connect a big artery and a big vein, we're going to carry a lot more flow in that vein that vein's gonna get larger, and that vein's gonna carry more flow. A bigger vein with more flow is a mature vein, is a mature fistula for dialysis. Now the maturation definition, when a fistula is mature, what that means is it's carrying, there's been many definitions, but the most recent one are actually two. One is the clinical definition, and one is the FDA definition. The clinical definition means that vein should get about five millimeters in size, should carry 500 millimeters, of, uh, millimeters per minute of blood flow. It should be about five centimeters in length so you can get a, two needles placed. And it should be less than five millimeters from the skin because you don't wanna have a vein way down there to, to put a needle in. That's sort of the measurement of a fistula for maturation. The FDA, and we'll talk a little about the FDA, the FDA feels it's not really any of those things. What it is is if you for one month clinically can get 75% of your needles placed successfully. So an average week is three sessions. 
So three sessions in a month is 12 sessions. So if nine of those 12 sessions go well in dialysis, then the FDA and many people feel that you have a mature fistula. So maturation, there's many ways. The best, the best way is get your veins ready, get your arteries ready, be healthy, do everything you can like you did, James, to be healthy, and get a great surgeon who has experience in fistulas to put a fistula in, whether it's at the wrist or in the, in the endovascular techniques or in the upper arm, whatever you think you and your surgeon want. Then the key is help that fistula mature. Mm-hmm. How do you help that fistula mature? You continue to do exercises. Someone's going to show you a ball like this, and they're going to say, squeeze this. By doing this squeezing exercises, what I'm doing is I'm basically, I'm basically exercising my hand. And by doing this, I'm increasing blood flow to my radial and my ulnar artery. By doing that, I'm increasing blood flow, more blood flow into my fistula. More flow in a fistula means shear stress increases. Shear stress increases, the vein gets bigger. It's very simple science. Now, there's now, other ball, things we can do. The ball do. seems pretty easy to squeeze it. How how much do I have to squeeze it? Like a little bit? I would say a day. Once Ten times, sorry, I can't see it here. There you go. Ten times in an hour. And I'll tell you, James, everybody gets this, but after about a couple hours, the dog has it. Yep. And no longer people are using it. And it's really frustrating to sit there. You're watching, unless it's a tense movie or a tense football game and you're really nervous for your team losing, you're going to do this. Or otherwise, if you're healthy, enjoying your life, you're not going to do it. These things are great and they're wonderful, but there's many other ways to make your veins bigger. Doing weights, 10-pound weight. It's fabulous. I'll tell you what I teach, and I've been teaching this for about 15 years before I started my company. I teach my patients to go ahead, squeeze this, but also squeeze this. This technique is doing a couple things. I'm bringing blood flow to my hand, Mm -hmm. and I'm preventing the blood flow to go back. So where is the blood going to sit? In my veins. And when it sits in my veins, that wall tensile stress is going to increase my vein size. So I see a patient today in January, and he or she wants a fistula from me. Right in January, that patient's going to get one of these, start exercising, and start squeezing here. You can squeeze here. You can squeeze here. If they want the fistula up here and they know, and then, you know, I had a patient who was a piano player. He teaches piano. He didn't want to have a big fistula in his forearm. He thought his students, his young students would be concerned. So he said, can you put it in my upper arm so my sleeve can cover it? So we started planning it. He started squeezing here, started squeezing this, and by doing that, he started dilating his vein. We did a beautiful fistula on him today. It should mature very nicely. So I'm all about, you're going to need a fistula. You make sure you have a great surgical approach for that. I'm also a big believer that instead of being reactive, let's be proactive. Let's start getting our stage three and stage four patients to start exercising their veins and get their veins ready. So that's a little bit about fistulas, how we place them, the mm-hmm. maturation concept. It's something I've been passionate about for about 30 years now in my career. I think from my college days to where I am today with my company, it's all been about veins. I'm probably one of the biggest advocates globally for arm vein care. I think arm vein care is uh, the Rodney Dangerfield of medicine in the sense that nobody <laughs> really cares and gets no respect. But yeah. I will tell well, you, the only ones that care about it is the nephrologist in the hospital. To be honest with you, the, we're the exactly. only ones, and they they get pissed off. Could you also go over uh, the needle draw, lab draws, and stuff, um, and needle sticks? Where do you all, where they should avoid them and stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. So, if you if you think, and it's probably the most important medical thing I'll share today with everybody is you have an arm, and I know the camera. There you go. Thanks, James. You got some major veins in this arm that you know. There's a lot of superficial, smaller veins. Those are, those are there, they're cosmetic, and they're great for little blood draws and those kind of things. You have a very important cephalic vein here. This cephalic vein goes up to your elbow. It connects into what we call an anacubital system here, and there's some deep branches. And then here, my cephalic vein goes on the outside of my arm, but then there's another very important vein, and that is on the inside of my arm, very deep in this space here. It's on the inside, closer to my chest, and that's the basilic vein. And that's a deep vein, but it can be used many times to make a fistula. So basilic here, cephalic here, cephalic here. When you go see your nephrologist this week, 
Make sure you talk about your cephalic vein and your basilic vein. Make, them, make him or her very happy. Now, <laughs> Dr. Butt's question is really important. I got a cephalic vein here. I got a cephalic vein here. I'm stage three, and I got to go to the hospital maybe for an orthopedic procedure, and they want to. I'm right-handed, so let's say they want to put something on my left arm like an IV or a central line, like a pick line for IV antibiotics. They can start instrumenting my cephalic vein. And I will tell you this, and it doesn't take a lot of education to know this, when you start instrumenting cephalic veins or basilic veins, they can clot off and they can get scarred. And all of a sudden you went from a beautiful cephalic vein to a scarred cephalic vein, which means no fistula using that vein. So you want to avoid putting catheters, IVs, in your cephalic veins, in your basilic veins, any of these crucial veins for dialysis. Because if you're the advocate for your patient, if you're the advocate for yourself and say, hey, look, this is my left hand. This is my non-dominant hand. I need a cephalic vein protection and a basilic vein protection because I may need a fistula one day and I want to have that vein ready. Please find another way to put a catheter or something into my arm vein. It's really important And guys out there, you guys should... A lot of your, these vascular centers will actually have um, little wristbands you can put on your wrist to say no cannulation on this side. So again, if you're if your non-dominant arm, so if you're right-handed, left hand, you want to put that little uh, that little uh, band and saying, hey, don't cannulate over here, and make sure those nurses know. A lot of nurses may not know. You know, this is very specific niche industry niche niche medicine thing we're talking about. So some mm -hmm. some kids some. Uh, some some uh, nurses may not know, so you got to stay up on it. Again, preserve those veins like Dr. Singh is saying here for access creation later on. And again, uh, one more thing he was saying, and, and I think um, uh, James mentioned it. Why do you start here, bring it up here? Again, once you go up here, you can't come here. And if you're a young person, we want to preserve as much real estate as possible along your arm, right? So um, be careful with your veins out there. Uh, Dr. Singh, can I ask you a question? Like uh, there was someone yes. out there um, asked a great question, you know, and I've gotten this question for numerous people because I'm all about exercise. Me and James have talked about it. Yep. We have dialysis patients out there that have fistulas. And I've heard from different surgeons, there's weight restrictions as far as what they can lifting and stuff like that. What's your opinion on that? So I will tell you. And so once again, this is me now giving medical advice as if I was in my clinic. I'm a big believer that if you have a good artery and a good vein, you get a great fistula and all of you are going to be directed to a very good specialist who will do a wonderful fistula. What I say is mm -hmm. once the fistula is placed, Give it about a week to let it all heal in, settle in. Uh, I usually tell my patients that after a week, they can start doing some upper arm exercises. Mm -hmm. And then usually within 10 to 15 days after surgery, I pretty much tell them they can do anything they want with their arm. And I think the activity is important, Dr. But I think, you know, if you're a typist, type. If you're a piano player, horseback rider, just go back to those activities. All those activities are going to help you get more blood flow to that arm, to your fistula, yep. more blood flow is going to get that vein bigger. The faster your vein gets bigger, and usually we say four to six weeks, the vein should be ideally ready for needle placement. Now, in some places in India or in Europe, they'll hit the four to six weeks. I will tell you many a times in America, we will see a patient trying to get their fistula ready three months, four months, five months. They're living with this catheter in the neck. Not a good sight. Oh. And so, so the more you can get back to that exercise, the more you can start stimulating your vein, the more you can start uh, taking care of your blood flow to your hand by exercising or anything else. And we can talk about, obviously, at some point, new technologies. But I believe seven to 10 days, you should be ready to do what you need to do, assuming your surgeon clears you there's no infection. But as far as like weight restriction, I, me I remember hearing this arbitrary number of 25 pounds. Don't lift more than 25 pounds. Is that something you, because no, si no science on that at all. There's never been a science paper that's reported 10, 15, 25. These are all, you know, at one time I, I'm going to say this and, and please take it the right way. One time people said, if you get a fistula on your right arm, never put something tight. Don't wear a spandex. Don't wear anything elastic because you will occlude it. Actually, the science has never been proving that. There's been anecdotal cases while well, someone fell asleep with a, a heavy tourniquet on their arm and their fistula clotted off. Yeah, it's possible. But more importantly, exercise and vein. The balance of wall shear stress, which happens with exercise, and wall tensile stress, 
which happens with pressure, is a fabulous combination. And that's the lead-in to which I think is going to be a, a, a device that I think uh, is going to help millions of people. And I think we can talk about that when, James, you're ready. But I think taking all those concepts, I also do want to say that if you don't have a good vein, and no matter what you try, you don't get a good vein, and Dr. Butt knows this, and many of our viewers may have these, you can get what we call an AV graft. An AV graft is a piece of Gore-Tex or a piece of carotid artery from a cow that's been preserved, and we can connect it to your artery here, to your vein up here, and now you got this big tube. Because your vein wasn't big enough, we wanted to get a catheter out of your neck, so we put in an AV graft. And we do those still. We prefer fistulas. You as a patient want a fistula. A fistula is your own tissue. A fistula has less likelihood of infection. And a, and a fistula will last longer than any graft. So yep. if you've got a good vein, a good artery, you're going to get a great fistula. And that fistula is all about uh, success long-term in your dialysis. And if you ask me today, what about, what's the most important formula for successful fistula? is a successful large vein. Awesome, now before we get into how to strengthen your veins, we had a couple quick questions. If I have a fistula installed in an arm, can I take my blood pressure in that arm or should I do it in another arm? Or the other oh, arm, that's I guess. A, yeah, so, so that's a great question, whoever asked that. And it, is a, it shows that you actually are thinking about your fistula and protecting your fistula, which is ultimately really important for all of us. Once again, the science would say that if you put a tourniquet on your arms, let's say I got a fistula here, here's my beautiful vein, my fistula, I put a tourniquet on here. I'm going to pretty much turk that tourniquet up to 180, 170. That's a very high pressure because you got to close the artery. Yep. So I will say to you that can damage your fistula. That can also, of course, if your fistula was hanging on, not really flowing well, you could clot it off. So I would say a tourniquet on the fistula has risks to clotting the fistula. Probably not going to hurt your body, not going to hurt your artery, but it's going to definitely. Now remember, most of the time those tourniquets will go up for about a minute maximum. So 180 millimeters of mercury for one minute probably is okay if it accidentally happens, um, but it can clot off a fistula, which may be on the fence of clotting. And that's really important. When you get a fistula, you want to make sure your nephrologist, your dialysis centers are really taking a good job of monitoring the flow. Remember, the 500 millimeters per, mer millimeters per minute is really important for a fistula uh, flow. Got it. Can, now, can I ask another follow-up on that blood pressure question real quick? Yeah. So, yes. you know, um, uh, Dr. T Dr. Singh, we got a lot of patients out there probably on dialysis right now, and they've probably already moved on from one arm to the next, right? Now, we've talked yeah. about not doing dialysis on the same size as your access, but what about... You had old accesses here. You moved on the other arm. Is it okay to take blood pressures on this arm? And if yeah. so, how yeah. accurate is the blood pressure on that arm? Is it going to be off it, a little bit? With the no, no. Remember, blood pressure measurement is all about the artery. So if your artery is uh, not got peripheral vascular disease, not got hardening from atherosclerosis, um, mm -hmm. it should not uh, be a problem. Uh, and the, the arteries with tourniquets are, are fine. And you're probably going to have to bring it up pretty high because, as you know, with renal disease, many times the arteries will get hard. Yeah, and that's the problem we have, guys. A lot of times we have a hard time getting proper blood pressure on you guys because you have such bad vascular disease out there. What about, uh, can I ask you another question? Um, Please. I IVs we talked about. Of course, if you guys out there, if you have a fistula in this arm, never let a nurse get an IV in this arm or draw blood on this arm. Never do that, right? But mm. what happens if you have an old fistula in this arm? Is it okay to draw blood or give start IVs yeah. in that arm? Yeah, so once again, an old fistula is a fistula that we've abandoned. Basically, it's clotted off. It's not carrying any flow. It's just basically a clotted vein. It's a vein that's just full of clot that is not gonna do anything. So yes, you can. Now, and I'm also gonna say that if you've got a small little, a big vein here and you need an IV and this is the only place you're gonna get an IV, an IV here um, isn't gonna hurt my cephalic vein. But a, a, an IV in my cephalic vein here is a real problem. In my cephalic vein here, is a real problem. So if you have a phlebotomist or someone who's going to come and place an IV and he or she is new at phlebotomy or new at IV placement, they're going to look for your biggest vein. And you're going to say, please stop. Don't hit or don't touch my cephalic vein, please. Find another smaller branch if that's where you need to go, but don't hit my cephalic vein. 
And that's really an important line. And I think more people, especially on you know, Dad, Dad Vice TV, should be talking about cephalic veins and using that terminology for your better health care. Yes. Awesome. Now, I have another question from Barbara. She said she's had a lot of work, a lot of surgeries and stuff. How do you know if your non-dominant arm... Let's see, wait, let me read this again. Um, if you have a lot of medical procedures, how do you know if your non-dominant arm is still good? Well, I think, you know, I think that that's really important. So obviously, you know, we like to start off, and Dr. Butt alluded to this, we like to start off with your left. So in my case, I'm right-handed and I'm a surgeon. So I would, if I need something, I want to have my sort of weaker hand, which is my left side. So I'm going to do everything I can to get anything I can on my left side, which is fine. But if you burn out all those sources and you've had multiple IVs and catheters, then when you see for fistula placement, if that's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. then Dr. Bud said, get an ultrasound, which is called the vein mapping. Vein mapping means you're gonna look at the arm, you're gonna look at all the veins that are left, you're probably still gonna have that basilic vein. I alluded to that earlier. The basilic vein lives deep, it's a wonderful vein. It could become the most important vein in your body when you need it. And it's very hard for people to touch it because it's deep. So get a vein mapping. They'll say cephalic vein, not good. Cephalic vein here, not good. The wrist or the antecubital veins in the elbow area, not good. Got to get that in there. Not good. <laughs> there the go. basilic vein. That basilic vein is key for you. And it will be good. It will be good. All right. So how do... I strengthen my veins, and when should I start strengthening them? Because it sounds like so, the earlier the better. Right. So I think one of the reasons that I'm really excited about being on with you two tonight, who I think, uh, you know, are obviously the reputation of both of you and what you're doing for the community globally. I'm seeing people all over the world uh, listening to us today. You know, we all don't want to carry the diagnosis of renal disease. And of course there's stages, but I think when you get, and obviously we're going to talk on renal disease today, when you get to stage three or stage four, you're really in a crucial part of your healthcare because you really do need to make changes. You want to delay dialysis. Mm -hmm. You want to avoid it. So at that point, I think a good physician relationship with the patient would tell the patient, let's start getting those veins ready. Let's start doing exercise, horseback riding, bowling, anything you can to get some flow to your hand and find ways to get your veins stronger. We all know that doing weights, um, doing exercise, you know, you look at the people who are in the, you know, look at the carpenters, those people who are filing and sawing, look at their arm veins when they come to your house to do a repair. They have beautiful large veins. They're exercising their arm veins. Mm -hmm. You can pick up hobbies to do that. Now, we I, I could totally see a data device TV bowling team, guys. I could so, really so see I that. So I have a question about the bowling. <laughs> bowling, uh, that's something I enjoy doing. And believe it or not, I have a custom ball. I am a good bowler. Oh, uh, my God. But I bowl but with James, my arm. Show, James, show us your veins. You have I, great veins. Yeah, but I, but I, I bowl with my right arm. So yeah. should I, if I want to str strengthen my, my left arm, my non-dominant, or wait. Ooh, he got you there, Dr. Yeah. Singh. He got you Should there. Should I try? Yeah. No, no. It's a, it's a great <laughs> opportunity to learn to be a switch bowler. Mm -hmm. Oh. Stage Ooh, three, stage four, right? So, you yeah. know, I grew up playing street hockey, floor hockey. I was right-handed, but I also learned to hold a stick with the left. If I didn't get a right-handed stick at the, at, the, at the field or at the pavement, I went with a lefty. You learn it. And if you're in that stage, learn to use your non-dominant. But if yep. you have to use your right, there are a lot of patients that will tell me, please use my dominant hand. I'm fine with it, and I'm okay with that. But exercise is really important. So me as a surgeon, and I think, you know, I think we can shift a little bit of the discussion now to mm. what I'm wearing. Yes. Is I'm, <laughs> I, I am wearing a European version, only available in Europe right now, of the fist assist device. This is an intermittent it's like a blood pressure cuff device. It goes up to a pressure of 60, only 60. And many of you probably have blood pressures higher than 60 and probably less than 200. It goes up to 60. It's an intermittent pneumatic compression device. It has software which opens and closes. And basically it rests on my cephalic vein. It'll help my cephalic vein 
if I move it up here a little bit more like I can and bring it below my shoulder, it can help my cephalic vein here. It can help my cephalic vein here. It can help my branches in this area. What I'm doing is I'm using the science of wall shear, wall tensile, and a device like this, which is very easily Velcro applied, simple device is the fist assist device. Available for sale in markets in India, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, can be applied safely before fistula care, after you have your fistula, and even if you wanna bring it to when you get your needles for cannulation. This is a novel intermittent compression device. So what's so exciting so said, about this device? So this could help in the maturation of the fistula itself, so after it's placed, you're saying? Right, exactly, and that's a trial. We're very excitedly working out the details with the FDA for America. But I will tell you this, Dr. Bud, if you have a fistula, and I tell my patients this, you have a fistula, do your exercises, okay? And when you do your exercises, don't forget to squeeze. And I don't mind my patients mm -hmm. squeezing their fistulas. If you go to Facebook, we have a website, we have a group there of what we call Arm Veins Global. Many of these are dialysis patients who are learning ways to open and close their fistulas with their hands, basically saying, I want the changes in shear and I want the changes in tensile stress to help my fistula mature. And so there's a lot of science on that happening. And if you take that science and then you put that science into a device, it's the perfect marriage mm -hmm. of clinical science, basic science, exercise science, and changing the standard of vein dilation globally is fist assist and the fist assist device. And it's, it's, it's something I don't have to think about. I just put it on, let it do its thing. It does it. Do I still do the ball? You sure can do it. More the merrier. You know, if you want to do one hour of exercise in the gym or you want to do 10 hours in the gym, more the merrier if you can tolerate it. But I tell our patients, wear the device. I'm going to put it on here down low. Um, but you can put it up. Wear the device. Before your surgery, start wearing it. Wear it for one or two hours. Get that vein ready to go. It's an enhancement device for veins. You can do the same thing by doing weights or squeezing your veins. If I squeeze my cephalic vein like this all day, my cephalic veins, you do it at home tonight. Take your arm, squeeze your, squeeze your arm right there. Just squeeze it for 10 seconds. Watch your cephalic vein get large. And if we want fistulas down at the wrist, which I think are great fistulas, they're the Brescia fistula. This is the 51st year anniversary of the Brescia fistula, which was created at Harvard University by Dr. Brescia. Start squeezing your arm right below your wrist, you'll watch your vein get bigger. I'm watching my vein get bigger right now. Of course, it's also dependent on, do you drink caffeine? Are you in a warm climate? You know, are you under stress? Is your room temperature balanced? All those things can affect our veins, but there's no doubt about it. Exercising and squeezing your vein can make your veins bigger. And as I've always said, that a device like this, which only goes up for 20 seconds, Dr. Butt, goes up to a pressure of 60. The highest pressure in a fistula is 50 because it's such a vaso, it's such a dilated vein and it has no so arterial big. tone. So it dilates. And so the pressure is 50. That's why the fist assist safely goes up to 60. It just, and remember, the other nice thing about a fistula is a fistula, you have a main vein, but that main vein has many branches. Mm -hmm. And so even if you close the fistula, the branches will carry the blood for you so you won't get a clot. So this is the science of what fist assist devices and our global approach to helping fistulas, vein care, cannulation. I call it the I call it the renal DMC or the run DMC protocol. Fist assist devices wants to make a device that can help with renal dilation, renal maturation renal cannulation and i want to come back at some point on this show and share with you other ideas that this device can help with hand pain and other indications and uses that are going to be rolling out in the next year with fist assist i love the idea of helping with hand pain you guys are going to be shocked <laughs> 
so so some people have seen me i get hand pain and some people have seen me in past shows wearing something on my wrist i wear a compression sleeve i now have a a giant compression sleeve that i wear during the day which helps greatly but i actually have this gigantic device that i put my hand in throughout the day to kind of squeeze and exercise my hand to help with with hand pain and it, it actually works but this thing is gigantic it's charging right now it is believe it or not this is wireless it doesn't work when it's plugged in um but it's just i can't take it places if i go into the office i can't take this gigantic thing with me the fist assist is small it actually fits under your shirt so it looks like it could be something that's you know very very portable you could wear when you're at work correct yeah, the whole concept of physiology of arm massage, forearm muscle massage, wrist, you know, the wrist is, you know, we're talking, of course, of mm -hmm. your wrist pain, and you don't have a fistula from what I know, nope. is that you got muscle soreness there. So by increasing focal muscle exercise, compression, increasing blood flow, there's all these new, we're learning so much about external healthcare and external devices, James, that I think that it's only time that innovation and devices come to the fistula space and fist assist is positioned for that reason we created this company for that space yep awesome now you mentioned it's available so so i dev you're definitely come back more than happy and when it's when you have something about the hand and helping with that oh i'm first in line sure, sure. now this device is currently available in a lot of countries as a medical device uh, it's it's almost available as a medical device here. It's still going through F, the final part of FDA approval, correct? Yes. But there yes. is a version on Amazon that is, um, can you explain the difference between the version that's on Amazon and what will be coming out once it's FDA approved here in the US? Yes, so the FA1 device, FA1, Fist Assist 1, is the fistula device. And that is the device that is presently being sold Europe and all the countries and continents that really engaged us and were really happy about it. And I was very happy that my native country of India, where I was born, uh, immediately approved the device for use in India for fistulas, for arm. The Fist Assist VIP device is a wellness device, which is basically wellness. So we talk about self-esteem, vein enhancement, vein exercise, not really promoting anything science or medical related, but basically saying that you can get a device that basically at very low pressure, um, almost like squeezing your hand, mm -hmm. can compress your vein and give you some enhancement. Some people like bodybuilders like to have their veins a little bit enhanced. Oh, so yeah. it's a low, so it's a low version, uh, non-medical version. It's more of a wellness version. So if you think of wellness, health wellness, now of course you can do wellness and you can do many reasons for wellness. Um, we very much feel that with the ongoing trials and the plan uh, and our ongoing discussions with the FDA, that Fist Assist will be available in the near future uh, as a dilation device, as a hopefully maturation device. You know, with the FDA, it's all about not only being safe, but also mm -hmm. making sure that you have benefit. And we feel that the trials and the plan we have will give us the benefit, will give us the efficacy, but as of today, Fist Assist is not marketing any device in America for fistula care, for renal cannulation, for renal uh, fistula success, none of those things. We will be very excited and we will announce on your show when that day comes, when this device has a American indication. Awesome. Now for someone like me, who hopefully dialysis is really, really far out, like so far out that I hope the artificial <laughs> kidney is here by then. Okay, that's what I'm hoping for. 70, 80 years old, then, I, then I'll be okay for dialysis. What can a device like this do for me? Can it help? I, I, I never thought of it, but probably the reason nurses love my veins and they stand out, they always are like cross the room like, whoa, we can see your veins. It probably is because I used to be such a big bowler. You know, and yep, yep. a 16 pound ball, not a light yeah. one. I was a heavy ball. Uh, I was good. I was good. I used to teach bowling. I loved it. Uh, I'm going to start doing it again, just to exercise and start trying my left arm. Left arm, left arm. But can a device like that help someone like me who's 
gets labs often. I want my veins to be easy to find. I want them to be large. I want them to be strong. Is this something that someone like me should be considering since I get labs often? Yeah, so I think that that's a, that's a space once again. You know, if you're at home and you want to get your veins bigger, so you, let's say you're thinking I got a blood draw coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you can go and start bowling with your, you know, the arm that you want to use. You can start doing weights at home. You can stop caffeine. You can keep your temperature in your house at 85, you know, degrees Fahrenheit and really warm it up. Go, you know, go to a sauna. But if you also just squeeze, you'll do that. Mm-hmm. You know, you can also, you know, you can buy these little blood blood draw tourniquets that they use for the blood draw. You can put that on. You know, I wouldn't fall asleep with it on, but you can do some of those exercises at home. And you're right. If you don't want to do any of that and you just want to relax and have an easy night not doing it, a fist assist pneumatic compression device is doable. You can buy a you can buy a home blood pressure cuff device and put it on. But all yeah. these things make a difference. All these things make a difference. And the whole concept of arm vein care, arm vein care, James, is, is really a, a, a really a, an exciting topic. It's something which I'm really passionate about because I think the science, the basic science, exercise science all comes together in arm veins. And really they get no respect. They get no mm-hmm. real respect in terms of anything we think of, we take them for granted. They're really important. Yeah, well, well, I remember when I was in the ICU, so I spent a week in the ICU and I suffered a number of issues. Um, first of all, my potassium was extremely low. So I had an IV um, in one arm, I was getting potassium. I had an IV in both arms with all these different bags and stuff. At one point, they couldn't find veins anymore. They couldn't do the blood draws. And they brought in some big machine and they were looking. I'm guessing that's the scan. They were looking. Yeah. It's called a vein, infrared vein, a, a vein finder. Yeah. yeah. Right. They use and even those that was to... hard for them to find in my hands. I can't remember where they ended up doing it, but they found something somewhere. Um, right. So I understand now how important it is to take care of your veins, to be thinking of them. Because that was not fun, them poking, poking, poking. They weren't getting blood for the blood draws. And the first few days they were in there, it felt like every hour taking some kind of blood or at least every couple hours doing blood draws. Uh, I was in really bad shape when I went in. I ignored my health, you know, the symptoms and everything until I had to go to the hospital. I had to go to the ER. Um, But it sounds like something like this, you know, Vein health is important. I love the idea of this. I could put it on, I could get one of those balls, and I could sit down and watch some Netflix, chill and strengthen my veins, you know, while I'm kind of zoning out with with the movie or something or a TV show. Absolutely, yeah, this, this James. Is, and yeah, this is That's actually right. really changing the way I, I approach a patient here, Dr. Saying. Like I've never, you know, typically when we start, when I start is the vein mapping. And so what I like about what you're doing is you get their arms big and their veins big, and then you actually, I guess that at that point you do the vein mapping and you refer them for, uh, ref- do the surgery. Is that right? You know, that you I'm, know, I'm lucky. You? I don't do vein mapping anymore. I see my patients two to three months before surgery. I get yeah. their blessings that they're going to exercise. And then when they come to my operating room, I know that they have made a commitment with me to exercise and get their veins ready. I can do an intraoperative ultrasound in the operating room mm-hmm. as they're getting, and I keep my room temperature very comfortable for that. And then I'll pick mm-hmm. the best vein. But many times in the holding areas, they're showing me, my patients are showing me the vein that they developed for me. I mean, this wow. is like the gift to a surgeon. And wow. they say, hey, Dr. Singh, you you remember my veins weren't on in the clinic? Here, look at, I got my vein at my wrist. I want you to do it at my wrist. And I love mm-hmm. that. They're engaged with me, and mm-hmm. I know I've got their support to do their surgery well. Yeah. Wow, that can is I, Can I ask you another thing? Can I ask you another thing, Dr. Singh? So, you know, yes. we, we, me and James have talked about exercise and stuff like that. And I, I'm really about not just cardio, vascular, cardio, but also weight training. So would you also incorporate maybe like a five pound weight, just kind of doing that? Would that, that be, have equally as much kind of thing that, as a squeeze ball or no? Absolutely. Dr. Butt, those are the things. The squeezy ball is easy. You know, you can buy it for five mm-hmm. cents. The weights, five pound weights, you can get those used from somebody who bought them for the new year and never used them. And you can <laughs> yeah. do those. But those isometric exercises, yeah. yeah, those <laughs> isometric exercises, those are gonna bring down your the amount of fat in your arm. 
It's going to make your veins pop up. Remember, you want your veins to bulge out for dialysis. You're going to get needles into that vein. Let's get the fat yeah. out of the way and get some healthy skin so that that needle can go right from skin straight into the vein. So isometric exercises, five pound, 10 pound, do the compression. Don't worry. You're not going to hurt anything. You know, if you're going to go for a walk with your loved one, have him or her grab your upper arm. Just squeeze it every, you know, every two blocks as you're going for your walk. That's going to have because your arms are moving, you're exercising, yeah. and you're getting some squeezing going. It's all good. Yeah. And the device in its purpose is for people who may not want to exercise, understandable, people who may live in an area where it's hard to exercise because of their commitments with their child care, their loved ones, they may have a sick family member, put on this device, it runs for one hour, wear it for one, two, three hours, internationally, not in America yet, and, uh, and, and, and see what happens. And I will tell you, here's a great example, and I want to leave with this. You know, we, I'm a surgeon, and I've been very proud of having the career I've had, but I want to leave you with a story of a gentleman who right now in India is using fist assist and his story is dramatic. In his dominant hand as a young boy, he got into an accident and had to have an an hand amputation as a young man. So he lost his hand on the right arm. He lived his whole life without a right arm, even though it was dominant, doing everything with his left and left and left. But when it came for dialysis, which happened to him because of many years of medical uh, diabetes, he needed a fistula. He had no hand on this side. This was now his sort of non-functional hand mm -hmm. because he had a good left hand. He got a fistula. He learned about fist assist. And he said, I want this device because I can't do hand exercises. I can't do weights. Is there any way science will help me make my fistula larger? He is actively wearing the fist assist device in India today. His story is going to be presented at the ASDIN conference in nephrology in February as the first use of pneumatic compression to help a patient develop a fistula when he has no hand. Think about wow. that. Yeah, because he's not using that arm wow. hardly at all. You would think it would he'd almost lose the arm as an opportunity for a, a fistula. But wow. The surgeons, I give credit to the Bangalore team of Dr. Desai, and the MS Ramaya Medical Center, they run the dipsum of our first studies in India. This patient came to them with this problem, couldn't exercise, couldn't bowl, couldn't squeeze a ball, but needs a fistula to develop. Here comes the fist assist. And you know, at the end of the day, the reason we make technology and the reason science is advanced, and I give credit to even the FDA for being careful about all science advancements and being careful about it, but we have an amazing opportunity in renal failure care in this country and globally to give devices that I think science is asking us to deliver. And Fist Assist and Fist Assist devices, find <clears throat> us on uh, Facebook, find us on the websites, learn about our technology, learn about our science, um, and, and hopefully we'll be making many Americans uh, happy with the device in the near future. Wow, that is awesome. Were you going to say something, Dr. Butt? Oh yeah. So uh, again, so, you know, th again, this is totally making me think differently. And from my own knowledge, just to rehash everything from your perspective to get good vein care, um, you know, CK late stage CKD three or say CKD four patients who are at that stage, right? Like GFR 35 or less or something like that. Um, what do you think r right off the bat? What do you think they do? We, we talked about the fist to fist assist device, right? If you get that, you use it two to three times, uh, two to three times, two to three hours a day, right? Just put it on your arm. Also, the sure. exercises, the handball exercises. How many handball exercises should you do in in a day? And how how much weight? If you were to do a five pound weight, how how many how many time reps and how many times a day? Same, uh, so just so my for my own education and for the patients out there. Um, yeah, all, yeah. All three and a few people have asked that exact yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. So here's what. Let's make it a scenario, and I think we're getting close to time here. So I'll finish yeah. it off with this. You got stage three. You got stage four kidney disease, and you're out there. Uh, I'm very confident you're getting great medical care and you're going to partner with your nephrologist. I would take a squeezy ball like this. You can go to a pet store. You can get one from uh, your nephrologist. They're available online. Squeeze ball, stress ball. Do that maybe 10 times every minute for about an hour a day in the morning, an hour a day in the afternoon. So two hours there. Uh, go for exercise. Do walk. Take 10-pound weight in your hand, 5-pound weight in your hand. Go for your walk. 
Keep those weights in your hand. Get that blood flow going to your arms and to your hands. So that blood flow goes in the arteries, the veins get that blood flow back. If you want to start practicing for eventual pneumatic or fist assist care, you can get the wellness device that's available or start squeezing your hands when you're doing the ball exercise. What you're doing now is I'm squeezing and I'm squeezing, I'm doing a double squeeze. Or have your child, you have one of your older sons or daughters squeeze here. Start doing this. I'm bringing blood flow and maybe do that one hour. You know, obviously you don't want to have somebody there all day holding your arm, but you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, keep the temperature in your house at a steady temperature, wear warm clothing, stay away from cigarette smoke and caffeine and Diet Cokes aren't good and all that, stay away from it. <laughs> if you do those exercises, I can assure you in three months, you will be saying, I got a beautiful cephalic vein. Awesome, awesome. Now I had one question I wanted to get in here real quick. Deb, who is a regular, hey Deb, great to have you here. Um, she's asking which arm should she be getting her labs in? So I'm guessing she should be getting her labs in her dominant arm because Deb, I believe, is not on dialysis yet. I think she's like me. Is that correct? I think, th I think uh, the non, and so in that situation, you're looking for a small needle for a blood draw. Okay, you could probably use either arm, but you want to tell them stay away from my main cephalic vein. That's important. Cephalic vein, cephalic vein, cephalic vein. It's all about the cephalic vein for dialysis. So small branches here, no problem. A small branch back here, oops, here we go, no problem. Small branches anywhere, no problem. Cephalic vein, big veins, anacubital veins right here by the elbow, stay away from that. That's a good vein for dialysis in the future. So yep. any little branches. Now, another nice thing about doing compression, if you do compression, you're gonna make small branches. So those small branches will help with blood draw. Awesome. So Deb you're, Deb, you're in stage three. We would recommend either arm, but stay away from your cephalic vein. Perfect. All right. Well, we are now coming up to the top of the hour. This has been a very, very educational, very, very informative um, broadcast here. And I want to thank you, Dr. Singh, so much for sharing your knowledge, sharing your information. Of course, thank you, Dr. Butt, for being here as always. This is a great platform. What, you know, our audience really, really listens. This stuff really goes straight to their heart. Um, they take notes, they follow up, they listen, which is fantastic. Like how you spoke earlier, how you really like those patients that are being proactive, the ones that say, hey, I'm gonna exercise, and they do it. That is our audience here. Um, so thank you so much. This has been incredible. For those of you that wanna learn more about Fist Assist, there is a link in the description below this video. You can also go on Google, search it, and find out all sorts of stuff. There's a version, a health version, um, available on Amazon here in the US. Soon, um, you were saying about maybe near the end of this year, late this year? Yeah, it all depends on the trials. COVID, of course, has affected a lot of the trials and the enrollment in trials, but you know, I think we're optimistic that we will be there and uh, we're appreciative and we will announce it as it gets available and uh, we wanna thank you. And I need to say, hi, mom. Yep. <laughs> there you go <laughs> i think my mom is watching from chicago so uh i wanted to say hi to her awesome that is great all right thank you guys so much for being here this has been fantastic and everyone else i will see you next week in the next video bye everyone thanks everybody <laughs>